Scotty Sattler, welcome. No, uh, you. We saw the stuff with your dad. We have yeah. known John Sattler on the game. What about growing up with him as your dad? Oh, it was great. It was really good. He's a great dad. Uh, for a son, he was a great dad. I know that. Um, never got involved in, in sort of your career as a junior, ever. Um, didn't want to stick his head in too much. But uh, myself, my sister and I, we grew up in pubs our whole life. You know? So he didn't drink until he retired in 75. And then his first business out of rugby league in 76 was a pub in Gladstone. And um, so we basically grew up living in the pubs that he owned. So great childhood. Probably not the, the, the childhood you want for most kids, but uh, we wouldn't give it back. But he was, he was, a, he was, a, um, he was a great dad, um, a good mate. And uh, I just knew that whenever, whenever I needed him, he was, he was always there. And he was like that as a player as well. So you wouldn't have seen much of him play? No. But as you grew up and even as a young fella, did you understand, like, you know, just seeing your dad and how people reacted to your dad, the enormity, I suppose, of him as a player? Yeah, I, I didn't understand until the very first Origin game, 1980. So he took me along. I was, I was eight, years age, eight years of age. And, um, and we kept... On our way out of the game, we kept stopping. People just wanted to talk to him. I didn't understand why, why people wanted to keep talking to him. So um, that was probably the first that I realised that he was, he was pretty special in rugby league. And, and then growing up, just reading the scrapbooks that my mum had put together for so many years, it sort of it had dawned on me pretty early that, that he was very well respected in the game. You said that he stayed out of your junior career. Did, did he give you any pointers? And what do, you, what do you take from his career that you implemented in your career? Yeah, yeah, Bill, I've got to say, um, I, I learnt really early on when I, was, when I was about 17 or 18 and I realised I was going to get an opportunity at some stage with what was called the Gold Coast Seagulls back then. Well, the Giants and the Seagulls were the national team. I, and I realised early on I was only, only going to be a, a role player in a team. Um, and th he always said that to me. So what do you he, mean by that? Well, he said, you know, he'd watch me play. And when I started getting a little bit of interest from clubs, he, realized, he said to me, um, you know, you're never going to be a John Raper or a Ron Coop, but you're going to be a, a role player, which means whenever your teammates need you, you just need to be there. Well, you need to be a 5'8 or a centre or... You need to jump in a dummy half at times. You just need to be that player. And so I, very early on, I, I was really comfortable with that. And so I truly, the one thing he really tried to focus on with me was, he said, just try and be the, the fittest player on the field. So him being a guy that used to love his training, um, he, he set a, a bar, the bar really high early on about, about me just trying to be a, the hardest trainer wherever you go. And I tried to really stick to that my whole career. What about the other side of things is some of the abuse when you were playing when you were a kid? Mm. Did you cop any of that? Yeah. Or the burden of being the great John Sattler's Yeah, I've I, I got to say, we were playing at a place called Bean Lee once, halfway between, between the Gold Coast and Brisbane, and I was playing under 14s. And I remember my mum on the sideline being attacked by a couple of fans, a couple of ladies, and, and that was because they were abusing me and I didn't hear it, but mum sort of tried to stick up for me a little bit and say, hey, listen, just let the kids play. And... A couple of fans turned on her. Um, I've got to say, it probably worked in my favour when it came to getting selected in some of the, the representative sides as a kid. Um, but then, as you get older, you'd like to think that people sort of wouldn't look at you that way when it comes to um, you know, how they view you as a player. Well, the moment we all talk about is that tackle with uh, Rabs. And I think it's probably a stage where you came out of your father's shadow. If, uh, if we got that tackle and you can hear Rabs' call when you, you made that tackle on Skinny Burn in that. What grand final was that? 03. 03. Yeah. 03. 03. Here it is here. We'll just listen to Rabs' commentary. Then he scoops the ball away to Burn. Burn puts on a fan. Then he puts on a sprint. Sattler is chasing. Sattler has made the tackle of the day. What a tackle by Scott Sattler. That's one of the greatest tackles you will ever see in any game. Do you feel like that moment, it was you and you're away from your father's shadow? No, and still don't today. OK. You know, I, again, because I, uh, like, I loved being that role player, I just felt as though, still even after the game, when everyone was making a, a big deal of it, I still thought, well, that's just what a lock forward does. You know, that's... I'd grown up watching videos of Ron Cook mm. do that weekly and, and Johnny Raper through Dad's old videos. So... To me, that was just the way that that position played. And Johnny Lang prepared me for that as well. The first day he got to training, he said, I want you to play like an old school, school lock. He said, when it's fifth tackle and the ball's on the opposite side of the field, I just want you to start, just start heading in there just in case you needed. 
So Gerds went across and put mm. the kick in. Gerds always says, um, I made your career, but you saved mine. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, that was just, even after the game, still today, I just felt as though that that's the position that, that you're meant to do in that, that number 13 jersey. So, But it was my last game for Penrith as well. I was... I was um, heading from the club after that and, and going to the Tigers. And, and for me personally, to, from a selfish point of view, I, I felt oh, I, didn't, I can at least sort of leave the club now and, um, and leave in, in a good light with the fans and the players I've got to play with. Well, it typified your, your mindset around, you know, be the player when your teammates need, when your teammates need you, be that player to be there in that time. I, I wanna, like Technically, at the end of that tackle, was perfect. Your body position, you put him into a spot where he couldn't step back inside you and then you accelerated at him. I want to know when you when you actually took off because the frame doesn't actually catch your anticipation of what's going to happen. When did you feel that you were going to be needed? Well, I, when I saw Gerds leave the left-hand sort of centre position, he went over to that right-hand side and, and to take the fifth and last tackle. I, when he took off, I just started, just, just gradually, just sort of started heading in behind really slowly, like you can't see it there, but I just started heading in behind and um, and like Johnny Lang had always said, just be there in case you need it. And, um, and I remember Reese Wesley, it's funny in that, you know, in those situations you can't hear the, you can't really hear the crowd, you know, everything's silent and in those big, those big games. And I remember Reese Wesser yelling at me, I've got you inside, I've got you inside. And when I when I looked back, Reese was Reese was about twenty or thirty metres away. So he actually <laughs> sold he sold me a dummy. He made me believe that if I kept going, I, I could yeah. get him. So, um, you know, Toddy, who was a fine winger, I've got to say, and mm. Freddie, you played a lot of footy with him. He, he, I suppose, on that being a wet night, I think it for us mud runners, it, it makes it a little bit easier for us. Mm. Luke Lewis also got a touch on him as well. Yeah, I was right. I was right in the middle of all of that. I, I remember the ball rolling. I thought I can't pick it up. Are oh, you passed? Yeah, I passed the beautiful ball. pass. Yeah. So actually, I, I, I remember it spinning. I went, well, I'm not going to be able to pick it up and run. I thought I'll just try to hit, hit skinny. Seals calling for it, and he took off, and Luke Lewis just got him and touched mm. him, and he, he sort of broke stride Checked a little him, bit. Didn't yeah, he? yeah. So it's amazing how all those little moments, you know. And what were you thinking when he was running? Well, literally, I went like that. I thought if I hit him... No, but you were, on, were you on the ground watching Skinny Burn take off when he was running down the sideline? Yeah, so I threw the ball, and once I hit him, I thought I'm good. Well, I thought he was good, and then Luke Lewis got him. Uh, just tapped him, and, and all of a sudden, you could see, yeah, once, uh, once you saw Scott in, in the pitch, he, mm. I think he had him covered pretty much from a fair way out. I remember Ronnie Coop once told me as a, young, as a young kid when I started playing lock, he said, I said, how do you keep doing those cover tackles? I was about 16, 15 or 16. I said, how come you keep doing those cover tackles? He said, head to the corner post. Don't take your eyes off the corner post. So I remember, I remember that. I remember looking at the corner post. And I remember when Daly did it last year mm. on Stephen Crichton. You, you look at that footage, he just looks at the corner post. He doesn't even look at Stephen oh, Crichton. Yeah. Mm. And all of a sudden he came into the picture. And, and if he comes into the picture late, you're, you're a fair chance of getting him. Getting back to your dad, when you're in the pubs, yep. when you wake up in the morning and have to find your dad in the pub, you would hear him sing. Tell us about that. So my dad had a beautiful voice. A lot of the guys who played with him, Bobby McCarthy, that would tell you how, how beautiful his voice is. And, and growing up in the pubs, I used to wake up, I used to always go downstairs and try and look for him. And he'd be in the keg room somewhere mm. or somewhere in the, bar, in the pub. And the song you would have heard is, you went to the break just South before, Sydney. the South Sydney song. Um, and now that we're all, we're all in the bar. Around the bar, yeah. Yeah, so you could hear him singing that in the keg room. And that, I'd just follow his voice and <laughs> I'd follow him to whatever, whatever bar he was in. Um, yeah, so he was. Yeah, we moved into the pubs in '76 and basically ran the pubs and, and lived in the pubs. So when they used to get back, when they'd all get together, your dad and Ronnie Kurt and Bobby yep. McCarthy, would your dad sing that song all the time when they were together? Every state of origin that was in Brisbane, the the entire South Sydney pack would come to where whatever pub we had. Name them. Who and was there? John O'Neill. So the Lurch O'Neill when he was alive, um, Elwyn Walters, uh, Dad, um, Gary Stevens. Bobby McCarthy, Ronnie Coote, Paul Sait, and then wow. George Biggins. And they'd just sit, they'd sit around. So the, grand, the State of Origin, of course, is on the, is on the Wednesday, and on the, probably the Monday or Tuesday, they'd all have this big boozy lunch, and, and I'd sit at the end of the table and just listen to all their stories. You yeah. didn't play for South Sydney? Well, you played, did you? No. You didn't I'd, play for South Sydney? I didn't, so I, I had a chance to go there uh, early, and I didn't want to because I wore jersey number 13, and that's yeah. Jad's jersey. And then when I was leaving Penrith, um, I had another option to go back there and because, again, jersey number 30, I just didn't want to taint that legacy. I just thought that... 
I just thought that, in that those days, it's kept... a, Jersey 13 was the front row. It was, yeah. Not, yeah, not the lock forward. Exactly. That all changed in the you know the mid '80s, mm. I think, or the early '80s. It all changed. Yeah. So you wouldn't go to South Sydney because your dad played in the 13 jersey. Yeah, exactly. If it was another another jersey number, I would have gone there. Yeah. Well, what about strange. the bloke wearing it now, Cam Murray? What do you make of? Yeah. What do you make of him? Well, he plays like that old style sort of lock forward game, doesn't he? He's a little, little bit like a chameleon. Whatever the game asks him to do, he just turns into it, doesn't he? You know, it's uh, he's a great competitor. Like. Um, and again, we, we, we lost that old-fashioned 13, the way that the old-fashioned 13 plays, and he's sort of starting to bring it back a little bit more. What about the other jersey that you got to wear, the maroon one? What would that mean to you? Yeah, only once. But, you know, as a 31-year-old, it, it meant that, I suppose, you know, all, the, all the, uh, the hiccups you have along the way and all the pitfalls that you have and the peaks and troughs, so you get the, you get the option to, to finally run out and, and represent Queensland. It was a huge honour. Massive honour. Um, would have loved to have done it more. And I had a couple of guys in front of me by the name of Gordon Tallis and Tony Carroll and Darren Smith that were there for a number of years and, and Brad Thorne. And, um, but to get that option was, was, a, it was that opportunity was, was amazing. You know, to, to go into get to day one of the camp and hear the way Choppy Close spoke about the maroon jersey and hey, you don't own it. You know, you've only got a lease on it till the next guy has it. And um, I remember a story actually where um, Gordy said, if you see a New South Welshman in the street, don't talk to him. <laughs> to everyone. We're like, oh, okay, right, yeah, no worries. So we're walking down the main street of Parramatta and Rico and Craig Fitzgibbon are walking towards us. Two of the nicest guys you'd ever meet in rugby league. And I went to Gordy, I said, oh, it's Rico and Fitzy. And we're sort of like four days out from a game. He grabbed me under the arm and led me across the road. We had to cross <laughs> the road so we didn't, didn't, didn't have to talk to them. So uh, I loved it. It was a, it was a great experience. And as you know, guys, it goes that quick, doesn't it? It's over before it starts. When, um, when South won the premiership, was that 14. 14? What did that mean to the family or to your dad? Your dad was there, yeah. the iconic photo, standing next to Sam Burgess. Yeah. What, what did that mean when South won that? Yeah, it meant a lot to him. Yeah, usually you know, when, when you, you, you're the last captain or the last premiership winning team, you don't want another team to win it for a long time. You want to hold on to that memory for a long time. But he was so happy. He was, he was like a little kid leading up to it, to be quite honest. He was, he was so excited. He loved, Sam, he loved the Burgess family. Just loves the Burgess, loves the Burgess boys. And, um, and he loved how the, the North England boys, they're tough boys. Mm. They're, you know, they're, they're brought up tough. And, and I remember coming down with him for the week because he was, it was at that stage I, we noticed he was sort of starting to lose his memory a fair bit. And, and so I came down with him just because he had to do a lot of interviews. And I just want to guide him around. I remember we had to do an interview at Redfern Oval, just in that park at the northern end of it. And we were standing there while they were all setting up. It was going to be about 15 or 20 minutes. And it was like the Pied Piper. Like, word got round that John Sattler was in Redfern. So this kid ran off and then someone else ran off. And then all these people started... By the time the story... By the time they interviewed him, there would have been... 60 or 80 people just standing wow. around behind the camera that, you know, John Sattler was in Redfern. And even me, even my, at that stage of my 40, it, I still sat back and looked at him as a fan. I sort of thought, yeah, this guy's still got the same effect that he had on the community. Mm. Mm. So good. Yeah. But even when I used to see him, because he's from, <coughs> from up where I'm from, at yeah. Curry Curry, I used to get butterflies meeting him. It was so cool. Because he's such a gentleman too. Yeah. They had a testimonial for him at at uh, Junior Leagues Club once, Henry Morrison and everyone there, the, the committee, and, and Joey was there with, with his dad, and his dad and my dad, they had this great mutual yeah. respect for each other, and my dad used to keep his horses in your grandfather's yeah. paddock in Curry, and, um, and Joey came over, he said, do you reckon I can get a photo with your dad? <laughs> I went, he's probably asking whether he can get a photo with you, what are you talking about? It wasn't that horse that you rode in. No, it wasn't that <laughs> Well, Sats, thanks for coming down, yeah. mate. That was unbelievable. Thank you very much. So thanks, good. Freddie. This year, NRL on 9 is your one-stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights. Action. Seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast. Get that on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And, of course, my favourite, Freddie in the own. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.